Um, we'll try to get it up on YouTube within a couple of weeks if you need to look back at it for reference or anything, okay? Thanks for joining us today, Karen. Thanks. I'll turn it over to you, Bill. Hi, Karen. I'm Bill Armstrong. How are you? Good. Hi. Um, we're going to, I've prepared a PowerPoint presentation um, that I try to always have a conversation when I do one of these kinds of classes. So you can interrupt me at any time. If you need to take a break, just say, hey, I need a break. Um, hopefully somebody else will dive in here. Um, yeah. I was, I kind of base these on, con like I said, conversational. I'm going to talk about conversations a lot. And so that we can have a dialogue and, and understanding because my experience in the 20 plus years I've been doing living history work is that most people don't really have a, 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 an understanding of what it really is. I mean, they have a concept, they've seen it, they've encountered it. And so um, if anything sounds weird or cryptic or I'm not being illustrative enough with my, my examples, you please feel free to uh, interrupt, so. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, absolutely. And um, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna share a PowerPoint presentation. Um, let's see, come on now. And I'm, I'm gonna cut back and forth between these. So I'm gonna have some YouTube videos. The reason for this is because when Janelle and I originally talked about doing this, we talked about doing it at a historic site like Leadville or Fort Vasquez, where I'm the, the director, and having contractors from the living history field come in and, dis and demonstrate for you. I think that the power in the tool is actually seeing it firsthand, experiencing it, and it is, it is an experiential um, sort of experience. So. What has your, been your sort of uh, interaction with living history? Um, let's see. Um, well, I work at 17 Mile House, which is a historic property. Still haven't been there. I need to go there, though. Here we go. Um, I have recent, a uh, year ago, became a, a certified interpretive guide. Um, so I kind of that thought process that I'm always trying to think of how can I make it interesting and bring it alive between the costumes and what I'm doing and explaining or giving them a story um, either about the people of the house or the activities. Um, I'm not sure I when I went to the um, interpretive conference last year I'm not sure I'm I'm new at all of it so I'm not sure exactly if I'm doing it correctly between first person, third person, all this kind of technicality. But in general, that's what I'm trying to do. It's so just, um, yeah. one of the things about this workshop format is I want you to be able to bring me your examples, especially if it becomes one-on-one, -on -one, you know, bring me examples, ideas, please feel free to share. I will, I will always, um, I'll give you my, my experience, I've done the gamut. Um, I've used to do first person exclusively and so forth. So we'll, we'll get into that. I'll, I'll break it down so hopefully you understand it better. And please, like I said, you're not offending me if you want clarification. So, so this is about living history and being relevant in the museum field. If I can get it to advance. First tech, oh, there it goes. So a view of what we're gonna cover today. Identification and methodology is basically what we're going to talk about. Um, this is, I'm glad to hear this say you're, you know, you're still grappling with the different terminology and maybe, you know, how do you apply those? I'm going to help you do that. So what is living history? What kind of tool is it? Why do you use it? Why do it at all? I mean, what's the point? I mean, you know, is it, when does it stop being interpretation and start being entertainment and do those things ever meet? Um, is it effective? Can you make it so it's more than just, I mean, I get a lot of the, I mean, I've seen thousands of visitor surveys over my career as a lead educator, lead interpreter and, and director of museums and seen some weird, that's off-putting or, you know, or it's really great. I was, I could, I could have stayed hours. So is, what's its effectiveness? Who's really capable of doing it? And that's often a, a hard thing for a site to determine. Sorry. I'm in kind of a new chair and it's kind of small. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so can anybody just walk into your side and do living history? All right. I mean, just because they have enthusiasm, you know, this is a big pitfall. 
Um, so yeah, I don't know if you're in charge of any volunteers or any staff, but who's really capable of doing it and what their expect because I think in that sense, people come armed with their own expectation, uh, especially if they're hobbyists, reenactors, as opposed to someone who just, I just am baffled by what it is, let's do it. Is your site appropriate to do it? Um, just because you have an old site doesn't mean it necessarily is. This is a little sort of subcategory of who's capable, and it's called more than costumes. Um, because I think, you know, I. I've done reenactment. I still do a very limited amount of it, usually to help support historic sites or my friend's work. But oftentimes, people get hung up on the costume part of it. Yeah. And that be a pitfall. What are the trends in living history? Which is really what this class has started out to be is, you know, you could go to Williamsburg 30 years ago and see a guy make a horseshoe. You go to Williamsburg now and it's like a completely different street theater grappling with social consciousness type experience and, it, and you can do that in your own way in your own site sort of the tenets of living history now this is not just me talking um, I'll get into my history in a minute a little bit but it is you know kind of what I'm I'm sifting out and putting into my own organization based on the national the national sort of constant revision. Hopefully what the program outcomes, you can identify some of these when you're doing it effectively and, you're, and you feel like you're creating, because I mean the ultimate outcome is if people come back, especially people you start recognizing to encounter you or to do your programs, right? right. And finally, the, the big monster in the room or elephant in the room is the current social climate is really um, challenging. Um, even when you don't have things at your site like slavery, uh, you might or Indian Wars, you might have a host of things that you don't even recognize as being in your face. And so, hopefully, we'll we'll look at some things today. I'll give you some tools to go do some further research, and then we'll bridge it into tomorrow. Now, this class again is supposed to be two hours long. I originally had this for about six people. Figured we'd have some boisterous discussions, so it'll probably be end up being less. But there's going to be some video examples of what you can watch of what I'm talking about. So, any questions so far? No, that's cool. great. I'm just surprised there's <laughs> not more people. But this is well, you know, it, it's just kind of the sign of the times. I mean, we yeah. just—I was just part of a, a, a conference for an association I belong to, and we had, you'd think with all the computer stuff, it, it's just the sign of the time. So hopefully we get through this though soon and we can go back to our regular world. That's true. Who am I? I'm Bill Armstrong. Uh, I've been in museum work primarily through the interpretive and historic field for just about 21 years. Um, I started in California, and yeah, I'm one of those people. Um, start, and I, I'm not going to lie, I started in Renaissance Fair. I knew I wanted to do something that taught people history that wasn't at a blackboard. And from there I gravitated towards state parks and museums and worked on tall ships and built, built adobe forts. And, and by the time I decided to go to college and be a real, you know, get my history degree, I decided that this was what I was going to do with it. As of June, I became a board member of ALFAM, and that's the Association of Living History Farms and Museums. I was elected by my peers and on the finance committee, but you know, if you don't know about the Association of Living History Farms and Museums, if you're, this is a great support group to get more answers about what you're doing, more pointers. My views here are certainly not the totalitarian views of all of living history world, but these are the trends I see and kind of what I have, you know, stepped on their coattails to ride. So um, I'm the director of Fort Vasquez, um, which, have you been to Fort Vasquez? I have not. I have been past it so many times. Everybody, <laughs> if I had a nickel for every time I said that, I would have no funding. Um, so Fort Vasquez is obviously in the middle of the highway, and, and when I took it, uh, the position, 
I, I knew there was some living history going on there, but there's also Fort Lupton. They have a big living history presence. And so um, the biggest thing about it was I wanted to, to make very specific targeted living history programs that sort of dispelled that frontier mythology. And that's kind of how I got into it, because I thought the truth was better than the fiction, you know, um, of, of what people were doing on the frontier. And so I have a public history degree from Southern New Hampshire University um, in, um, with a focus in westward expansion and ethnic history. So, and my undergrad work was done in Oregon. Um, and so, Basically, my goal for this class is to give you as much information, a lot of an opinion of what I think is good, what I see the trends going, and give you, steer you in the right direction so you can make judicious good choices about your program. So now it's your turn. You get to tell me the same information. Sounds good. Um, okay, I'm relatively new in this. Um, and it was about um, 10, I guess now, actually probably 12 years ago, um, I became interested in um, our, my local um, historical society, Cherry Creek Valley Historical Society, uh, because uh, we just, my husband um, had figured, uh, had learned that uh, he is actually a descendant of um, people who lived in, who owned 17 Mile House in the late wow. 1800s. And so, and we inherited um, some trunks filled with everything. Photos, books, diaries. You How exciting. Yeah, so we were just like, wow, we were so fascinated with it. And so that's kind of what led us to, where is this? What are they doing? Um, type of thing. And so at the time, 17 Mile House was not open to the public, but we knew we had learned that the Historical Society was helping support them and was the group who had actually um, done the work to have that property put on the uh, National Register of Historic Places. Nice. So we became part of the Historical Society and um, very quickly, because they're a small group, uh, we ended up both ended up on the board. Um, and from there, we kept, that was kind of our end to be able to monitor what was happening at 17 Mile House. So um, it, it did, we stayed there and uh, we did a lot of work on the board. So that, uh, then I started doing a lot of, uh, the opportunity came up to, um, for that group to be a partner with 17 Mile House. And so I was a volunteer and spent a Very lot good. of time and I ended up kind of uh, coordinating all that. Um, they started with their first uh, openings to the public and, and so I was part of that to give the history perspective because being owned by the county, they were really only looking at uh, their, uh, the open space area and the maintenance area of it. So the history, mm -hmm. they had no clue. So um, I was able to, get in on that level and really provide the history with what we knew and what the historical society had. So I now, where was, is uh, that exactly located? I kind of have a vague idea because I, I know, it's a stage station, right? Yes, exactly. Um, a wayside inn. Um, it, wa it is uh, 17 miles south of Denver on the Cherry Creek. Oh, okay, gotcha. Yeah. Nice. It's, a, it's um, pretty close to Parker, headed towards Parker. That's kind of what I guessed, yeah. Yeah. So I've just, um, I, so I did a lot of volunteer work there and working with bringing in all the volunteers from the Historical Society, um, working with, and just went from there with providing the, uh, you know, writing up um, flyers and um, then got involved with school groups, um, started out just myself. Uh, we brought a few people in. Eventually now the last, um, Three years ago, I became um, a staff member. I was hired by the county since I already was doing all that work and uh, they realized the value that they needed that perspective. Um, so they created a position. And so that's what I do now with all the volunteers, with the visitors, 
creating all the programs, um, school groups, adult tours. Uh, we've had um, annual festivals that they like to do some living history. So uh, really I've put together all the history in that perspective for the property. And I didn't learn till last year that my thinking, I thought it was like thinking outside of the box, what I tried to put together for school kids, like using the diaries and things like that, um, was actually kind of this um, interpretive work. So now I've gotten into, it's just kind of evolved from there. I do a lot of other work for the open spaces with interpretive um, signage and different work, but that's what I really love mostly is how can I take what the history we have at that property and um, make it come alive for people, whether it's something they can do or that they can do hands-on or I can do for them or really provide questions. Um, so that's how. So that sounds awesome. That's a great opportunity. And the fact you wrote your own tech, it's amazing. You, it's pretty rare. Um, so what is your goal? What would you like to focus on since you have me as your oyster, your, you know? My your goodness. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, that's, I don't have that background as far as um, educational um, because I went to school, I went to college and had Spanish and a business degree. So um, I, that's the funny thing. I feel like this is my um, third career type of thing sure. uh, because I never ever had a clue that this whole world existed when I went to school. <laughs> Uh, you know, I knew history, but at that time, just local history wasn't where my passion was. And now I'm like, wow, and I would have gone back to school and to learn all this now. But uh, be able to do more to really dig into the resources I have, especially um, for this one family, and um, be able to really put it, I'd put a, like a lesson all together to be able to um, have people think when I address and talk that they're getting to know this family through these women because there were two sisters and then um, their children. Sure. So. Um, well, those are all worthy goals and they all create, what we're going to talk about, which is relevance to your site. Um, so we'll, we'll go over that today. Like I said, it's going to be the, the basics of the basics kind of and I'm gonna there's there's gonna be um, I'll get your email address I'll send all of the slides that have the different web addresses for books and resources and things you should read um, relevance and this is what we're going to talk about today is the relevance part is it seems to be what's driving it and right now because of COVID-19 um, and even before this, people were questioning why do we have living history museums, you know, and the industry was being, you know, defeated by its nearest competitor, which was amusement parks. And then right after that, high technology, why do people want to even go to these places? And so what we're going to work on first is what is living history? Why, why does it beat the other two things I just mentioned, amusement parks and, and, and uh, technology. And so hopefully the videos I show will kind of communicate what's special about it. Everybody who's been to a living history museum has probably seen somebody in weird clothes, right? Okay. Pushing the public, you've done it, I, you do it, I do it, and sort of rope them in and make them more interesting. It's really an educational technique Okay, it's not the only technique that a museum uses to have visitors. It's, it's very powerful with children. And it, when it's done correctly, it's very power with all, powerful with all ages. And does something what I refer, refer back to suspends your disbelief. Now there's a couple of different voices of living history, history that um, we'll talk about, you mentioned earlier. But they're both, they both have their own merits and stand um, stand alone and can be used interchangeably. 
So it utilizes interpreters, right? That's what we're talking about, His, history interpretation, not people who translate languages, but educators um, as part of a historic setting. And I, li I liked it, likened it to becoming part of the artifact setting. Most historic sites have some sort of artifact setting that living history happens in. Um, I'm actually blessed with one that is, has zero of that um, because there isn't any existing buildings. We've built our own, tailored them, um, sort of the lemonade, lemons with lemonade, uh, make lemonade situation there. But it's actually very freeing. Um, what's been happening in the last five to 10 years is there's been sort of a, a push to get rid of the old velvet ropes and historic houses to get rid of the static sets like somebody just walked away and left their work there and actually start using those more than ever in smaller museums. I don't know, now is there an actual house where you're at? There is, we have a barn and a house and then we do have um, a collection that uh, from, um, we focus mostly on what has been given to us from families who owned the property or lived there. Right. And so there's been a greater drive to like use pieces of the collection or to even take that collection out and, you know, relegate certain parts of the house to collection work and parts of the working part of the house to be a teaching, teachable setting for living history or interpretation. Um, one of the reasons that it works so well is that, and I'm going to talk about this more tomorrow, is museums are viewed as authorities. Um, just like you go to the dictionary and you expect to get the right spelling and definition of a word, you know, museums are sort of the holders of authentic knowledge. And with the internet uh, coming out, you know, and all that at your fingertips, um, some of that's been damaged because there is, there are varying degrees of historicity in museums. Um, and so by having a, a costumed interpreter doing something very specific to that site, it lends to that authentic voice. And especially if you can have a conversation, which means the visitor is driving what you're doing. Visitors talking to you, giving you information, and you're reacting to that. Um, one of the places I would encourage you to study to improve your program is a place called Connor Prairie, Indiana. It'll, I'll have it. Um, I've been there six times. Every time it is an amazing experience. Pretty much all the historic areas are first person, um, but they did a IMLS, Institute for Museum and Library Services, funded study about um, what drives visitors back in 2005 where they used recorders. Originally they were gonna mic the interpretive staff and listen to how they were doing their jobs. But they switched it up at the last moment and mic the visitors and they broke the visitor types into different types and they realized that a conversation, even if you're doing museum theater, like we'll see in first person, is much more powerful than you sitting and spouting facts or just talking and oh, to a script. And so that's, that's really its power over the internet, over amusement parks, is that you get to have a conversation. You have, just like we are now, a one-on-one -on -one with a historic character or someone who is an expert or appears to be in that historic trade or historic um, medium that they're in and knows that information um, with assurity and, and authenticity. Also, you'll hear me refer to something else called hands-on and minds-on. To me, living history, and this, uh, just about everybody would agree with this, is best when you can actually touch it, feel it. So if you come to Fort Vasquez to bake, to watch the uh, baking demonstration with the Orno, the, the Adobe oven, we let you do it with us. We don't keep you away from it. The, in dra drama, that's called the fourth wall. You can only see the stage and you can never go up there. We just got rid of all of that. Um, my goal is not to make the best bread. My goal is not to necessarily 
um, teach you to make bread. My goal is to allow you to explore historic bread making and insert little factoids as we go. And we'll see a, we'll see a version of that as best as I can show you that's recorded with a, 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 a cooking video we'll watch. So there's two types of living history. There's museum theater, which is the first person dramatic presentation of living history. And uh, we'll, we'll see a version of that. And it has its strength. Unless you've been ta taught in drama, uh, you know, you know, dramatic technique, or you've spent time practicing it, and there's really only one way to practice that, right? Um, it's very difficult to have a credible living history program that meets your goals out the gate. It's very, very intense. It's not impossible, and there are many good people who can do it, but I typically, when I've consulted for other museums in the past, steer them away from this or make it a very special presentation. So museum theater is, is often what people think of, and we'll watch a video version of that. There are historic life ways, which is really what I call third person, or sometimes experimental archaeology is sort of the um, European term. We'll cover that in a minute. It's a personal immersive demonstration in the third person. So I, as a historian, dressed in a specific way, are going to take you through, let's say, blacksmithing, how to make a nail. We'll talk about all the, the components, the technology, the history of it as we're doing that. And you'll get a chance to do that as a visitor. And it could be something as easy as, like I said, making bread, corn husk dolls. A lot of places do that and those are effective for children, but it often is lost on the adult visitors who wants to be more relevant. And that's kind of where we're gonna start jumping off the, the island here. And that relevancy gives greater meaning and to the past and captivates the visitor's imagination and hopefully inspires them to return and have advocacy for the resources. So what I'm basically paraphrasing there is the National Park Service, classic interpretive model. The reason that you have interpretation is that you, from a business standpoint, want visitors to come and engage in that activity again so that you generate revenue, but also so that they care about their heritage. You know, I mean, so they have an interest in their own history, so they realize its truth and its pertinence. Um, and then it creates that advocacy and enthusiasm for history, which is absolutely critical for people to enjoy museums. I think we're in a very pivotal time with what's going on and the way the museum trend is, and I'm very proud of History Colorado. Uh, our, our main building, as well as our little community museums, we all have some aspect, living history or not, where you get to advocate for what's important to you. And that's where the community part of it, the, the relevance comes in. The best way to do this, and what interpretation, whether it's natural history or cultural history, tries to do is answer the so what question is the way I was taught. What is the so what question? So you walk into a barn and there's a guy milking a cow in an 1860s outfit, so what? What does that mean to me? I'm just the guy who paid five bucks to get in with my kids. Why do you want me involved in this? And that's really the key is this use of, of both unspoken, nonverbal communication, verbal communication, and what's called universals, the common human experience that ties it all together. Any questions? No, I don't think so. So let's define it and we'll come back to those universals, okay? So this is my definition of it. It's an immersive replication of historic life ways or events. The use of demonstrations, museum, theater, or other te techniques like music. Music is a great one. Food is a great one. That eliminates the past, creates advocacy for resources and appreciation of the his historic common human experience. And I think that's what people, I mean, you go to Mount Vernon and sometimes they have living history. I can't, I mean, I find George Washington fascinating, but it has nothing to do with why he's 
I'm more interested in his hippopotamus wooden teeth than I am his time as presidency. Does that make sense? Oh yeah. Uh -huh. I could I could totally see myself having to wear those at some point and you know like what would that have been like or what's it like to you know be one of his slaves those common threads through life are what make history interesting and they've done studies on this I'm not just saying this it's, it's not just my brothers people are more interested I mean I'm sure you've had this stop me if you've heard this one before where do people go to the bathroom have you that out there yet? Yeah. Oh, you yeah. get that every time because people are interested on a base level of the hierarchy of needs of, of humanity, right? And what it means to be a person 200 years ago are really that different. And that's really where the relevance is created. We're not. And so my sort of design of a program is always looking for that common experience. So here's another definition this is from my friend Henry B Crawford he's from Texas he was the curator of history at Texas Tech he taught museum studies um, and this is his and I'll allow you to read that because I can't see quite all of it um, but it's the material culture is important the costuming or period clothing historic clothing is important the skills the ambiance and his is more theatric, but it's the same idea is that you're speaking to the historic experience with authenticity. And he was one of the people I was going to have, hopefully have come up and, and deliver. This one was a live format show. Oh, right. Oh. Um, but he, you know, and I mean, his ethnicity also speaks to what he does and what he communicates. And so we'll get into that when we do the social consciousness piece. But these are two very similar definitions of what living history is defined as. Now, if you go across the pond, you get into something else that I actually do a lot of, and I, but I don't call it living history necessarily, and that's experimental archaeology. It's a very similar thing in Europe, especially England. They like this term better than living history. It tends to be more driven by artifacts and archaeological findings, um, usually has a science technology aspect. So this is literally how I do workshops. Um, we build moccasins or we make, um, you know, rawhide or, or we brain tan uh, elk's hides and we learn the technological techniques of how people survive. And sometimes this is done overseas in a, what's called a protracted setting. So then you might even see shows on BBC or, uh, excuse me, PBS from BBC that show the um, what people living in that setting for a year, literally, without the drama aspect, just trying to live like like kings, let's say, in these pictures. Or um, sometimes it's in a special event where they, you know, they do the archaeology and then test, you know, different weapons or farming techniques or what have you and so that's experimental archaeology that is done here but it's typically done by archaeo it's archaeology driven in the united states and more done for um a very specific site like mesa verde would be a good example they sometimes do pottery and those sorts of things these things are often interchangeable but it seems like europe likes this te this terminology better than living history so the voices, are there any questions at this point? No, I don't think so. I hadn't thought about the uh, Europe and how they think. Well, they're very good at it. And quite honestly, I, I, I often fall down the rabbit hole when I look for things to train people with, videos to share. Um, we all lump it into living history. Um, it's really, there's kind of a little bit of difference. It's all living history to me, but I do like that term better. It sounds more less less um stigmatized and there is some stigma we're going to talk about it so so the voices the picture you see the gentleman at the bottom you'll get to meet him in a moment his name is bill barker he's been or he's recently retired from colonial williamsburg foundation he was there thomas jefferson easily three decades if not more um and you'll see why in a moment um 
first person and third person are literary voices used for writing. Um, the first person basically is the characterization tool. So I, me, mine voice, you're speaking as Thomas Jefferson, not Bill Barker. If you're him, you have a character context, and this is where it becomes really challenging. Um, because especially if you're one of these well-known people, and even if you're not, people will come to try and stump, stump the character. Um, that's a thing last time, and you probably already run into it. Um, you live in a historic vacuum, so you don't have a, and that often trips interpreters up, you know, because you get stuck in the, well, what's an automobile? What's a, what's a power drill? What's a cell phone? And this requires generally a certain acumen with dramatic skill or a lot of time to practice it and mess up. Um, it's one of those things that if you don't use it, it atrophies um, over time. And it requires a, one of the things I didn't put on here, in order for, now I know people at Williamsburg pretty well, um, in order to become one of the founding fathers, it's a three year course of study you have to complete. So you can speak with authority as that person. That's a long time to train to be George Washington. Or, I mean, it's, it's a pretty rig intense. So that's why generally you'll see, um, Bill Barker in sort of a controlled environment speaking about specific things. Although they do roam the streets, they do answer questions. Um, you have to know lots of, and then of course there's historians that come and try and trip you up. Third person, that's typically what I do. Nowadays, I used to do a lot of first person. Um, I do third person because I feel like one of the most off-putting things about living history as a technique can be that well, what's, a, what's the cell phone or, you know, it becomes quaint and sometimes off-putting to like, oh, you know, you're, you have a ringing in your pocket, sir, and it's this guy's wife calling him, asking him questions while he's at the museum. That takes away from the reason you're there. Um, the reason you're there is to have a meaningful, informative conversation about the past. And if you're constantly doing verbal sleight of hand with people, it takes away from that. So it's the they, them, their voice. You're speaking as the authority, the living artifact, if you will, in retrospective context. So you're talking about the history as it had happened. Um, it's still very research driven, but it's freeing for most volunteers and most untrained folks who haven't done it before to do the third person voice. Um, Cause you resolve modern era the whole time it's very freeing you don't have to pretend to like know what the word for car carriage is in your time period for example but it still requires that innate historic knowledge and it only comes from reading those diaries like in your case studying the crafts and the trades understanding animals and the weather whatever it is about your site very specific um, I started my living history career at a California State Park um, where adobe bricks needed to be made by, made by the thousands. And I only stayed for two weeks because I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be a soldier as a fort. That's what I thought I was signing up for. And now, you know, at the time I never understood what, why am I learning this? Now at an adobe fort, it's indispensable knowledge. So one of the kind of the things with third person is I encourage everyone to try and learn every bit of it. Even if you have an aversion to firearms in the modern world, learn those historic firearms so you can talk about them. You might be afraid of the, you know, chickens in the chicken coop at your historic farm, but learn to work with them, challenge yourself, because that's what the people come to see. And I'll, one other thing that I haven't mentioned yet is that if you have animals at your living history site, they don't care what they <laughs> They love that. So if you ever do like a kid's like animal farm zoo type thing, people love that. So that's a good, good way to create relevance because a lot of urban settings, and you know, I mean, we're, you're closer to Denver than I am. I'm about 45 miles away in the country, but a lot of urban settings, people don't get that, that farm life hand to mouth sort of existence. Um, but that's, 
that's the, the two techniques. So. Okay. That gives me a lot, a lot uh, clearer idea. I kind of have that, but um, yeah, it gives me a, a clear difference between them now. So. Right. So a lot of people use first person. Here's an example. You've probably seen one. There's the, um, it's Colorado Humanities Chautauqua program. Um, they, and I'll, I'll, I don't ask me to spell it. It's a, it's a, it's a native word from New York, but, or Ohio. Um, but it's a moment in time where you have an audience with a very famous, and we'll show, I'll show you an example in a moment, a very famous person. So you might, you know, see on stage somebody like, Mark Twain or, you know, Kid Carson or Martin Luther King talking about their lives. That's how a lot of people use first person. It's a, it's a encapsulated draw. And if it's really good, it's really good. Unfortunately, if it's real, if it's bad, it's almost really very bad. So third person for a living history setting, unless you have a lot of, of support for management, a lot of funding for proper period clothing and training, um, reading about handling a chicken is not the same as actually handling a chicken. So, so what I'm yeah. going to do is I'm going to change and I'm going to let you watch Bill Barker talk for a minute. Let me see, okay. share. Um, here he goes. Hopefully you can hear this. I did share. So these are, I'm going to pull up some YouTube videos. Mm -hmm. Um, and you can see the power of, if you ran into him just sitting in a historic house, how people would gravitate toward this. So here you go. Can you hear it? Oh, uh, yes. I beg pardon, you, you asked me about uh, my fondest Christmas memory. Uh, well, there is no question in my mind, no moment of hesitation. It was when I first rode down the Duke of Gloucester Street to attend the old Royal College of William and Mary, and there, uh, for the very first time, to set eyes on Miss Martha Wales, uh, the eldest of the four daughters of Mr. John Wales, so I was immediately smitten. But inquiring, I discovered that she was already spoken for by a classmate of mine, Mr. Bathurst Skelton. And two years later, Bat left the Royal College, and they were married. But I ever lament to, to inform that about two years after that, uh, Bat was overturned in a carriage accident uh, on the road to Jamestown, and very shortly thereafter expired. Well, the widow Skelton went into her usual widow's seclusion. All widows endeavored the same for about one year. But it was not even a year when I was riding down the Duke of Gloucester Street and heard in the distance the most melodious sound of a spinner coming out of a parlor window. Well, I recognized the melody. In fact, so did my horse. He perked up his ears, took me swiftly in that direction. When we arrived, well, I, I went up and looked through the window, and there was the graceful form of the widow Skelton seated at the spinner. I knew then she must be coming out of her seclusion. Uh, so I made a rap on the door, the servant girl attended, and I inquired of her whether the widow Skelton uh, would enjoy Mr. Jefferson to accompany her on his violin. Uh, she went in and returned to the affirmative, so I very quickly snatched my, my kit. Now, I, I wonder whether you know what a kit is. Oh, I, you should. It, it's, it's a miniature violin, only about that long, half the size in its width. It's what the music masters carry about in their pockets when they go about to teach music and dance. And that, every gentleman should understand, it's his greatest virtue, it's portability. You can carry it in your pocket so it's always ready for those immediate moments of romance. So I brought in my kit, the widow Skelton and I uh, commenced what became an hour's musical. And uh, when we adjourned, it was clear that she had accepted my courtship. Well, I was the further delighted upon taking my leave when the servant girl said, Mr. Jefferson, and do you know at the moment that you desisted in your accompaniment and the widow proceeded in a solo upon the spinet when I looked out the window and I saw to a distance down the Duke of Gloucester Street two gentlemen riding in this direction. The oddest thing occurred, the ears of the horses perked up, taking them more swiftly to this spot. They both quickly dismounted, ran up onto the porch, ready to knock on the door at the same time when it was then said. Uh, they heard the music of your kit uh, co-joined with the music of the spinet, and the one looked to the other in great disgust, saying, we're too late. 
Jefferson's got to hear the horns. <laughs> oh, we enjoyed the culture for about two years, and we were married on the first of the year. 1772 and the forest oh the ceremony was for 15 minutes you know the anglicans get married begin a family as soon as possible but the the revelry the revelry went on for two weeks oh mr wales was renowned for his hospitality and thereby at the end of january i hitched up my thing and mrs jefferson and i uh, began to drive westwards uh, there that i might introduce her to my mountain area well, within one day's travel, we found ourselves caught uh, in a snowstorm. We had no idea. This was the largest blizzard yet recorded in Virginia history. By the end of the second day, the snows were, were four feet deep. We had to abandon the thing, make the rest of our way on horseback. And when we arrived there at the foot of my little mountain, well, I, we tethered our horses in a shed that I had built, and uh, we walked uh, to the top of my mountain. Oh, it was nine midnight when we arrived there, and uh, all the servants had gone to bed, though I was beginning my mansion house, I was still residing in a, a small little brick cottage, uh, just one room. Uh, ever my bedchamber, kitchen, hall, study, cabinet as well, and, well, I must admit, I, I have never been successful on the fields of Venus, uh, that is, until then. And so I had constructed this cottage more or less uh, as my hermitage. In fact, that is what I called it. Uh, as a hermit, I would reside there amongst all of my books on law and philosophy. And can you imagine over the threshold of my hermitage, I, I brought my new bride. It was so very cold, I went immediately to make a fire. She busied herself amongst my books, and here I heard her let out again. And turning about, she had discovered a bottle of French wine hidden behind my law books. No, that was always a delicacy for a gentleman to have. We were forbidden to trade with any kingdom of Europe, north of the Cape of Finistia and Spain, particularly France. So to have a bottle of French wine, hmm, you were living. And I dare say next to that bottle of wine and that warm fire, and a gentleman would certainly not proceed out of decorum. But I will say that the next morning we used that empty bottle of wine to rechristen my hermitage as our hunting cottage. And so it remains. It's pretty powerful stuff. Um, right, yes. Um, you can see that, that he's had plenty of practice. Matter of fact, don't stop it. There we go. <laughs> So if you go and Google or look for Thomas Jefferson at Williamsburg, you will see him, and I may show this tomorrow, I haven't decided yet, a deal with difficult visitors who, um, well, maybe I'll show it. You can see how easily he deflects that. But this takes a high amount of skill. And that's a, he's a great example of someone who's very good at first-person interpretation. Not everybody is you know, at Williamsburg, there are dozens and dozens of people who do them independently. Like I said, Chautauqua, I'll try and find. One of the most famous is the actor Hal Holbrook, who played Mark Twain during the 70s on television, An Evening with Mark Twain, which is nothing more than first person interpretation. Um, one of the things, this was a set piece. One of the things that is really incredible when Bill does Thomas Jefferson for an audience, He'll walk among the audience, he'll take questions, he'll remark on them, he'll make, that's what I mean by a conversation. There's no fourth wall. So if you ever do a museum theater piece that isn't an actual play and you're doing a, a monologue with, this is, that's one of the powers of this is for them to, to comment and have a conversation. So I'm gonna shift gears a bit. Hopefully no commercials pop up during the middle of these. <laughs> I consider a really good third person demonstration. Now, this is by a company that makes historical reenacting clothing called James Townsend and Son. They have their own YouTube channel. And John Townsend, um, who's the son, who's taken over for his father, for the last five, 10 years has produced some really great videos where he visits living history sites. A lot of them are colonial. This one happens to be 1810, something like that. 
its historic locust grove in Louisville, Kentucky. And why I picked this video is because prior to doing their sort of relevance reinvention a couple years ago, it was just a historic house museum, which, you know, I mean, we all work in some version of that at some point and when you pare it down. But one of the things they knew when they looked at the business of the, of the house, and I don't want to give it all away, was that they had a distillery there. So their way they could get new visitors in, and that's what we're talking about with this relevance thing, was to find something that they could market that everyone enjoyed those, you know, everybody enjoys, a, you know, at, le at least the science of 19th century brewing, let alone and distilling, let alone the actual food component. So this is a 13 minute video about their sort of demonstrating how apple brandy was made in the early 19th century. So I'll let you check this out. And this is how I would foresee a really great, you know, this is kind of the kind of conversations that I try to, to cultivate with visitors is this, this. Today we're at Historic Locust Grove in Louisville, Kentucky. We'll be doing a special, this is a very special on-site uh, episode today. I've got with me Brian Cushing. He's a program director here at this site and our guest distiller is Alan Bishop and he'll be directing the, the episode today. And what, what are we gonna be making? So we're gonna be making historic Apple Jack style brandy is what we're gonna be making today. Apple brandy. So step number one, how do we get started? Gotta mash some apples. So we're gonna get started mashing some apples. about the mashing process versus grinding and why we're doing it with a stick etc yes sir so most of the early distilleries especially the farm distilleries or even the smaller industrial style distilleries they would have relied on as much of the primitive technologies as what they could because they a didn't have a lot of money to buy specialty tools but b on top of that the distilling portion of what they did was secondary it was ancillary to the farm work so they're going to get away with you putting as little into it as what they possibly could so on the on the bottom end of the farm distilleries you have this basic methodology using a stick to break up apples uh, but then you can have anything up to a small apple grinder or the people that had a little more money might even have like a nut mill or something of that nature with which they could grind their apples with uh, you might be familiar with modern apple brandy made from apple juice uh, obviously tying into apple cider uh, and you can make brandy that way. The style of brandy that we're gonna be making today is actually what they call apple mash brandy. And okay. the reason for the mashing over the cider is that you have a limited amount of time to work with when you're creating your brandy. And it takes one to three bushels of apples to make one gallon of brandy. So obviously much e easier, much more efficient uh, as far as the farm workers go to grind those apples up. And so the real difference here is whether or not we squeeze those apples out or actually throw the apples and everything into the still, correct? Yes, sir. Yes, okay, sir. so this apple jack style is like, hey, we're going to get this fermenting. We're going to yep. let the, all this stuff stay. We're not going to strain it out. We're going to toss it all in the pot, right? That's so right. that's the real difference. Yep. And the big thing about that is, too, that in that time period, so the apple mash cider, the apple jack that was made, was actually considered a higher quality than general apple brandy because you're actually in contact in the fermentation vessel with all the skin all the right. things that make an apple and apple all so, the solids and yeah. everything you're extracting even more of the flavor of that apple okay so brandy distillation is really about the concentration of the aromatics okay so right. the more of that that you can hold on to the more aroma you get the more flavor you subsequently get so with this apple mash brandy it puts all those elements of the apple in contact with the yeast which is going to convert sugar into ethanol mm -hmm. and subsequently you're getting more of the flavor of the apple from this type of mashing than you would from a juice. So the more mashing though we get, the finer those particles are, the more it can work on it, the more flavors we extract. That's yeah. why we might want a real fine grind as much as possible. Yes, exactly. So Alan, the, these apples are all chopped up. They're mm -hmm. nice and fine. What's our next step? So our next step is we're gonna come over here to our boiler. This is a 60 gallon copper boiler. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna boil some water and we're gonna use- Obviously we got this boiling, so. Yeah. 
Yep, we're going to use that water then to uh, cook the apples in, essentially. So, uh, so how are we going to do that? So we're going to pour the, the water directly over top of the apples, yeah. and that's going to begin that cooking process, breaking down those cell walls, releasing uh -huh. all those sugars, and breaking down whatever starch is maybe left in that apple from storage. And uh, at, at the same time, it's going to kill off any microorganisms that might otherwise interfere with our fermentation process. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, in the early days, those guys didn't know a whole lot about that. Right. They just uh, knew the best way to do it was yeah. this way. Yeah, they didn't, they didn't know how or why things worked. They knew how they worked. So right. just like our copper boiler, the reason that they used the copper was because it was reactive. So they knew that it would heat up faster than anything else that they had. The other thing it does is it captures uh, uh, different types of sulfur compounds and it cleans up the water. It subsequently cleans up the fermentation and the same reason that stills were made out of copper as well. So okay. um, they would have noticed those reactions over time, but maybe not known why. So we are attempting to drop our temperature down to about 90 degrees. So mm -hmm. that's where yeast likes to be happy at. And again, back in those days, most of the farmer distillers wouldn't have had a thermometer to check with. So it all would have been done by hand. So we are at about 90 degrees now, and we're gonna pitch our yeast and begin the process of converting all those sugars. How are they gonna know what temperature that is? Well, the yeast themselves, you know, they talk amongst one another, right. and, and they have an idea. They go, "There's a little warm," you know. Yeah, it's, like, yeah. it's like taking a bath. Well, I mean, how are we <laughs> how are we going to find out what temperature? How are we going to find time out period. in that time period? Essentially, you're just going to check it and make sure that it's nice and lukewarm. You mm -hmm. don't want it overly warm. Um, pretty close to obviously your own body temperature. Right. And so 90. We want this a little less than blood warm. Right? Yes. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. So once we pitch the yeast, that's going to kick off the process of fermentation. We're going to start converting all that sugar into ethanol and then also CO2. Uh, in a couple days, you're going to start seeing bubbles form and a cap form. Uh, once the fermentation is done, two things you're going to notice is you'll be able to taste it and you won't taste any of that sweetness anymore. A. Okay. And the other thing is when you pull your finger back out, you pull it out now, you can tell it's sticky. There's mm -hmm. sugar there. Right. When it's finished, that sugar is not going to be there. Right. So the so yeast, it doesn't taste sweet because it's all that sugar. It's all been fermented, right. yes. So the yeast that we're actually going to use is uh, is very particular to this to this style of brandy. So this is actually a yeast that comes from a distillery in southern Indiana called the McCoy Distillery, mm -hmm. and that distillery made specifically Applejack brandy. That's mm -hmm. all they made: Applejack and peach brandy. Tell me how you got this yeast. So we harvested this yeast. That that distillery is the only distillery I know of in southern Indiana from those farm distillers that actually still has a building remaining, mm -hmm. original wood and everything. So we basically we made the equivalent of our mash here, and we mm -hmm. set that around various locations in that old distillery. After 24 hours, we noticed that we had yeast working. All four of those samples fermented around the same time. They all smelled the same and they all tasted the same. So mm -hmm. we presume that they were all four the same or very similar yeast that was dedicated to the production of alcohol. Right. So that yeast can live in that wood for hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And uh, pretty proud and pretty happy to have this particular yeast to put back into work in this style of brandy production. Okay. So that's what so. you've got. You're going to add to this. Yes, sir. Yeah. So let's pitch it. All right. So that's as simple as it sounds. We're just going to open our jug up and, and pour in. So I should also mention that depending on how involved those early distillers were, they may or may not have cultured their own yeast. Mm -hmm. We know the McCoys did because they had their own yeast jug. And the yeast jug was basically a way of propagating your yeast and maintaining it and keeping it. And generally they would keep two around. They would have one that traveled back and forth to and from the distillery from work with the distiller. And a second one that they would usually put somewhere like in a well where it was closed up so it would stay cold and no air would get to it and they'd have it as a backup in mm -hmm. case they ever lost the original strain. Mm -hmm. So what's going to happen now is this is going to work off in six to seven days, essentially converting all that sugar to alcohol. After that six to seven day period and we get this down to where there's no sugars left, we're going to take it and we're actually going to bucket brigade that into the still. So this goes in uh, the mash, the, the apple bits, everything, everything goes straight in. into this. Yes, sir. Yep. Um, in the early days when they didn't have uh, mechanized agitation in the still, you'd actually bucket into the still and you'd have somebody stirring inside the still until it got up to boiling. Mm -hmm. The other thing they often did is they would line the bottom of the still with straw. And what that does is it puts a layer in and keeps this from burning to the bottom of the still. So we would go into the still and do that double pot still distillation process. So uh, when we're talking about that, what we're doing is essentially the first run on the still is we're bringing the temperature up to 172.3 degrees, alcohol vapor rises, comes up to the cap and across the line arm and over here out the worm. We're not doing anything to it to change it whatsoever, just capturing all the alcohol we can in about 50 to 60 proof roughly. Mm -hmm. We're going to capture all that and go back into the still 
put that back in the still, 172.3 degrees, and we're gonna make our cuts. So the first thing that's gonna come off is gonna be four shots, almost all methanol. Second piece is gonna be heads, so it's gonna be like acetaldehyde, ethyl acetate, uh, smells a little like fingernail polish remover. Uh, we'll hold on to that, and that might get rerun into another batch later on because it doesn't accumulate over time. And then we're gonna have our hearts, which is gonna be what we actually wanna drink, sell or trade. And then at about 90 proof to about 20, we're gonna have our tails where you have more water than you do ethanol. It begins to get a little bit vegetative in flavor. Still good alcohol, we're gonna save that and that'll go into the next batch that we distill again to rectify it even more. My name is Geneva. See, I told you there'd be commercials. So anyway, um, I think you get the idea. They're having a conversation and that's what's really important about the technique of living history. It's so easy to fall into, into the old hat way of doing things, which is, well, they're settlers, they must just churn butter because they're settlers, right? Because we think of that as like, and I'm just picking something out of my ear here, they must just farm corn because they're farmers. Why? This is why doing your research like they have done and honing in on what specifically was done at the site is so important. Like if I were you and I had the form of the 17 mile house, sorry, I don't want to confuse you with the other one. Um, I would be totally thinking about a food program. Like how do I, how do I do a food program that is like what I would get if I stop there and I'm assuming 1864 or something, right? Is it 1860s? Starts about 1868. Yeah. Huh? I'm sorry, I didn't hear that. Yeah, starts about 1860. So. Yeah, so I mean, that's a great idea for a fundraiser, for a signature event is like 1860s picnic or, you know, those kinds of things. Now, when I was at the History Museum prior to this, I studied the Latham Station diary, and that woman baked 300 cookies a day for travelers down during the, the gold rush. And so very similar situation. Use that, that information to your advantage. And so this goes back to what I was talking about, about universals. Universals are super important to people being hooked into this. So why do it and how do you make it? what's the effect in this what's the hook so this is really some stuff i learned early um doesn't matter so much the community communication you're using but the style the delivery if you notice and this is kind of why i show the video from james townsend with the apple mash that's similar to what we're doing at fort vasquez similar to what i've done in the last couple sites you're coming to learn bygone technology from an authoritative person in historic clothing, accurate historic clothing, to get a sample of the past. Here's the difference though, um, that you can't do with an alcohol program in that case. Um, although places do it, like Mount Vernon has George Washington's distillery and you can buy its liquor. Locust Grove, you couldn't, you, I don't think you can do that yet. But you get to taste or smell or handle some of the intermediate products. Like when we do bread, you eat a small portion of the bread, we give you a recipe to take home and make it in your own oven. Right. Takeaways are what create the very, very important, we'll talk more about this tomorrow, create that very important um, sort of repertoire and rapport with your visitors where they wanna come back. Like last Colorado, Colorado day, Last two years, we've done a small uh, gold panning uh, demonstration. People called, are you gonna do it even though there's COVID? No, can't do it, but it's created a following and that's what does it because what are the universals of humanity? We all experience physical versions of them. Hunger, thirst, exertion and labor, exhaustion, all those things are physical you know, wants you know, needs. Um, emotional, some examples are the feeling of hope, sadness, freedom. Um, 
well, it's emotional and ideological freedom. Um, belonging, um, tribalism, national identity, those are ideological. Your, your faith, your, you know, your, how, you, how you identify, uh, are you a confederate, or are you a you know, union soldier, and you're, you know, whatever. And so and there's also environmental things. We all know what cold is. We all know what heat is. We all feel the wind, the wet. Those are, you try to identify those targets in your program to create relevance. The easiest one is really hunger and thirst. I can't, people will always come for food. Um, matter yep. of fact, if you do a food waste program, this is like something basic, even if you have it catered, which I would recommend, you know, build it in your ticket price for the event, people will crash the event to get the food. So that's a real, that, and if that food comes from a recipe in that diary, so much the better. It lends authenticity. That's why a lot of sites have gone to, like this is what I'm trying to do currently, growing a period garden, having a period food waste event, and selling that period farmer's market food. There's a site on the resources I'm gonna give you called Nash Farm in Grapevine, Texas, that some friends of mine run. That's exactly how they run their circa 1900 farm site. It's a series of food events and entertainment. So the other effect of peace is, is the way you communicate to somebody. Most people get hung up, historians get hung up on details. And that's why I put this in here. So there's, I, I can never say this guy, this person's name correct, Marab, Marabane's rule of 738.55. This is a psychological maxim. So, Right now, you can see me. It would be even more impactful if I was in the room with you. 7% of what I'm saying are the words. That's the importance. So a lot of people think that historic interpretation, you stand up, the, up there and recite factoids and dates. No. Those are important. Those was what you find your, 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 your meat of your matter around. But that's not really the important part of it. We're going to revisit, we'll always revisit this. 38% of it's the tone and the inflection. One of the biggest things that I look for when I go to the, like look at a historic site as a guest and professional is the moods and the demeanors of the interpreters themselves. Believe me, if we're having a bad day, everybody knows it. Try and, I mean, this is the problem when you get into the volunteer thing tomorrow is if you have a grouchy, like I typically either have a grouchy uh, elderly volunteer or a grouchy, you know, um, younger volunteer, there's never anybody in the middle. It seems to be on the two ends of the spectrum. Maybe it's just my luck. Um, they will make, they can make or break your program. And tooling that person, getting, giving them the right work is very important. So if you've had a bad day and you can let somebody else take the helm, I would try and do that. It's not always easy to do. I'm a one person site, so I rely on volunteers. And if I'm not, if I'm, you know, my head's in the numbers, I got to get out of there. Finally, 55% of all of it is non-verbal communication, uh, face and gestures, and a lot of it's gestures and the attitude of your posture. This could Something we're going to talk about tomorrow. You can't interpret to children and children of different ages like you do to adults or even seniors. Children have a cognitive group, psychological grouping where they understand the world as they evolve through school. This is very well done in a book that I, I put on the list called Past into Present um, by Stacy Roth. She has a whole two chapters on this. You can't interpret to an adult. Like, I guarantee the whole thing with the yeast talking to each other in the barrel, that's the guy's pitch stick he does for kids, right? And he threw that just to be funny. But you have a voice for adults and you have a voice for children. And I would even caution you to even be very specific with children. One of the things that came out of the Prairie study that I talked about where they mic themselves was the 
Like, I'm 6'5", okay? To a kid, I'm Frankenstein. It doesn't matter how cool I look, I'm imposing. And I'm imposing to adults. So I always try to have children approach me, get down on their level, sit if possible, address them, invite them to play, and then you give them the information. But it's like I said in this quote here, it's not what you are saying, but your physical attitude and voice when saying it. And again, the best one of these are conversations. They're always conversations, not lectures. Time and again, this has come up in studies. If you sit and lecture as George Washington people, you're unobtainable. But if you're George Washington, the father, walking down the streets of Williamsburg, talking to a kid, like you would talk to a son, that's a whole different experience. So, questions? Okay. Definitely, that's very powerful. And I found that with, between very small children, even for a while we had some like preschool, very small children. Uh, then you get through the, even through fourth grade, of course, with history um, that they get at school. And then I, a lot of adults and we've, this last couple of years, we even have had more um, with um, seniors that come from um, like, um, what do they call it? Um, caring care homes during the day and then they take them out during the day to to mm -hmm. go to eat or to go you know go places and that was another whole set that i had to learn of you know yes. how to and talk with them and how to inspire them and get them to open up and, and then they're really in the past yes oh uh, my mother had that. Have I physical, physical or mental uh challenges or disabilities that something that you can you can kind of get a sense for but i have found over 20 plus years that you, each group is entirely different and yeah. one of the things i have found that works is to allow for extra time um right there's a whole different sensory engagement there and you really have to do your homework prior to them showing up if it's a scheduled tour because i mean one of the big deals about the fur trade in the West is guns. And so we do a gun program. That's not the program I do for generally people with sensory overload or sensory sensitivity. And so you have to be very careful and it causes, you have to really ask your questions going, going into it. So, right. So again, 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 conversations, conversations. So there's a book in, that I mentioned in the, in the resources by William J. Lewis, who it's called interpreting for parks visitors and the only reason i really put it in there is for the first two chapters and one of the things he, he opens the book up it's like at the head of chapter one it says most people would rather be devoured alive by predators than talk to another human being in a formal setting so that you can't have that fear when you do this kind of work and but he the first two or three chapters he really addresses this and tells you how to be at home so that's a really valuable tool and I've yet to see anybody really address this, and hopefully somebody will, the, those with um, disability and challenges, both sensory as well as physically. And, and some of our historic sites are tough. Stairs and gravel and broken pathways. So yeah, it's a challenge. But hopefully, you know, as you're building your site or building your program, you think about those things going forward. Right. So who is capable of doing living history? I remember when I first started doing this, I would take, I just wanted to build a program. And you know, when I was a younger fellow, more is better than less, right? And the bosses are like, we need revenue. We need visitation to go up. So I put this picture, of the, I found this on Facebook a couple years ago. There's a stormtrooper and a bunch of civil war. <laughs> No, really, the, the point of this is it's, it's not just anybody can do it. Now, reenactors tend to be a lot of volunteers. They love their subject matter. They know a lot of historic minutia. But, and I, and I again, I'm tons with tons of friends that are reenactors who, you know, work for me and who I know across the country who run museums. But well, all of us that run museums will say we'd rather have somebody who knows about the period or has an interest at least 
and is willing to do the work for, that we want done as opposed to why they're there. The hardest thing to, t to train volunteers is, is like, you were here for the site, not because you necessarily love the era. And many times that's never an issue. But there are those few who think that because they're so and such colonel in the Civil War Society of whatever, and then this goes on and whatever the conflict is, whatever the time period, they should have that lead interpretive role. Um, they're not a bad choice, but you, I would caution you, I've had some bad experiences. Even some really ugly things are said by some people because they think they have the authority and the knowledge. Um, at my site, and, and History Colorado is very conscious of this, I don't really speak about Native Americans in a detailed manner, only that they're clients, only that, you know, who they were as tribes, and I acknowledge their existence. Oftentimes, you can get into trouble with that, uh, especially with reenactors, because they've developed opinions for their own research, or they have, I mean, a lot of the, you go back 20 years, in the historical books, many of them are popular. The, the social consciousness of those tomes aren't contemporary and you know, run the risk of offending people. So be careful with historical reenactors. They're often your best people. They love what they're doing, but their enthusiasm can be troubling at times. I'm sure you have some. Yes, I do. <laughs> those with specialized knowledge, and that doesn't just mean reenactors. That could be school teachers, public speakers, Maybe you got a guy who's from the local brew club who wants to do historic beer for you because you discover the recipe. Those people still have to comply to the same sets of, of rules as everybody else. Um, th there's those people who simply believe and love this site. Um, you know, they may not be historians, but I'll just, you know, you said your husband was a descendant. Maybe he's got that holds the descendant card and he feels like, you know, this is a really good thing for me to talk about my family's memories. That was a great person to do it. So now we shift a little bit to the period clothing, which is why a lot of people, especially reenactors, they see the clothes and that's the first question they ask, Who, where do I get the costume? When can I start? Yeah. Period clothing, not costumes, is what you should be looking for. There are many people, and we'll talk about that tomorrow, who provide those, who can do them. Um, and the, the, the biggest thing I see with period clothing and volunteers, especially reenactors, is their clothing should not detract from what you're doing. Matter of fact, you know, you think that in a fur trade forward in the 1830s, I would have mountain men falling over the walls. And we actually dress like the laboring class that probably built the fort. And we do have a couple mountain men, but they're specifically picked for that, almost like casting. And that's because, you know, and they're relegated to certain programs and certain days so that we're not detracting from the overall. Because I'm not there to teach about mountain men and teach them about 1830s frontier life in Colorado. So that's more than just trapping and shooting guns and, and arguing with Indians or fighting them. It's about how do we get our water. What do we feed our chickens? How do we make adobe bricks? So that's those those things that are more flashbang are very very attractive, but that's really not the mission, right? I mean, I'm sure you had with guns and cavalry soldiers, all that. But so in Colonial Williamsburg, they call this horses, muskets, fife, and drum. That's the concept they teach. I've actually been able to sit on some there with some of their people. And this concept of horses, muskets, fife and drum is what drives most of their programs. So you I'm not saying you shouldn't have one that's about, you know, you cavalry soldiers of the Indian Wars in Colorado, if that's your site. What I'm saying is that's not the only program though that should drive your attendance. You should really be looking at those other things that speak back to you. So, I mean, I'm sure the food waste thing would, would be probably more and you put that in there as as the special a special feature so right. animals and explosions and guns always drive attendance animals is probably number one yeah, yeah i think so i mean if you know anybody's got chickens i don't care if they're not even period chickens if you had like a farm day and had some somebody bring a cow or something people would show up droves 
Yep. Can't compete with animals. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> You'll say something about that. Don't I'll never work with children or animals or something. I'll have to find that tonight. <laughs> but he's he's right. So, any questions about or observations or things you'd like to share about this? No, it just makes me feel good that a lot of things that either I've worked people I've worked with or things to try to put together with the volunteers, especially. I have a lot of. I have some, a few historians, um, but a lot of people who just like that history. And so I've had to really work with what each person likes to do. And it's if, a lot of, it's a lot of designing a good living history interpretive program with good people. It, it takes a lot. People do not realize the amount of time management for and, and talent management it takes. Um, and the thing I didn't put on here is never make somebody do it who doesn't want to. Absolutely. That is a very big that, one. That is probably, well, we don't have Bob today, and Bob's the guy who does the blacksmithing. You know, Frank, you're going to do it. If Frank isn't into it, it's a waste of time. You just click. Exactly. The, you know, stuff happens. People get sick. People's cars break down. You just, sorry, folks. I would right. never do that. You know, it's, it's not a march or die situation. And you'll find... Sometimes museum administrators, like directors like me, who don't understand, they're like, well, we have to do it anyway, we promised. No, but do something else that you're more capable at and make it better, so. Right. Okay, so this is my favorite, when and why it fails. So the picture is from a show called Parks and Recreation, where they did a parody of a living history farm. And oh, okay. uh, um, it's hilarious. It, 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 it's, a, it's just a hilarious episode. They churn butter in it. Um, anyway, so when and why it fails is because it's not relevant to your site and it's not really dealing in things people are attracted to your site for. And this is really speaking to your main program and the people who do it. You can always do something secondary and slip it in there. But if you're advertising we make period old fashioned 1860s beer and you're not an 1860s, you have no grounds for that. Or you have a very badly dressed Indian who's obviously not an Indian, you're in a lot of trouble. So that's what I call it when I mean parodies history, you know? Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's not doing the history justice. It doesn't, it just scratches the surface. A, a good example of this, and I'm not trying to pick on them, I've, I've only, I don't know what they're, they're an amusement park, is Dollywood in Branson, Missouri. They do all these old time things. In oh, okay. Knott's Berry, we had Knott's Berry Farm as a kid, and they had a place called Spillican Corners, which was like a, you know, old timey blacksmiths and people making rope. That's parodies of history. While there's actual information there, what does it have to do with telling the story and creating an audience for your site? And that sort of goes in the speaks in the general of terms. Old time people churned butter, okay? Old time people made horseshoes. That's, that's why no one goes to see your history program because it's too general. And, it, and sometimes too, speaking in general terms, there's sites that do historic timelines where they have Vikings all the way up to World War II guys with all their reenactment stuff. That works for a couple of years, but after 20 years, that program is dead. Mm -hmm. It lacks relevance, right? It's not telling the story of your site and it's not speaking your community. I don't know what, you know, Parker is like. I mean, it's beautiful. I've been through there a bunch of times, but maybe Parker's got some big interest in growing corn. You should probably do something with corn at your site and draw on those community members and do something historical with corn if that's part of your farming. Um, like ours is sugar beets, you know? Right. Or we did an exhibit because of the sugar beets. They had Hispanic baseball teams in the area, and that was put on our exhibit gallery because it's relevant because we had a team in town, a little town next to me. That's why we do those things. A lot of people just plow the field, make the candles, bake the bread because it's old timey. Don't follow right. that. Because no. then eventually you're going to insult somebody's culture and ethnicity. 
Um, this, this is true of like uh, a place I worked at a Swedish American building and no one had the Swedish American society took it over and it became a parody because it was full of modern Swedish items, cultural icons like doll horses and kitchen witches and recipes, but didn't speak to the hardship of the people who actually lived in it in 1900 and nearly starved to death in winter. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. I mean, the Swedish American society, had we partnered with them better, we could have made, that could have been a win-win. We could have helped them build their relationship with their museum and have some historical reference to Swedish American immigration. This one's on here preaches. And this is the danger of first person. Someone typically, when we were talking about the cell phone thing, I alluded to it. And I've even done this in the past, and it's a horrible thing to fall into, making fun of why people are dressed funny, um, why they have a cell phone in their pocket, or quite honestly, the whole monologue is about something that skirts social acceptability, no matter how good or compelling you think it is. I watched um, living history dramatists do this. And then it just falls into the off-putting and embarrassing category because you're sitting up there going, why are you doing this? You know, I'm, <laughs> I'm trying to think of great examples of this. I've seen some Chautauqua presentations that obviously were slightly politically motivated from a modern perspective, but made commentaries on groups or on current events that were embarrassing to the person because they didn't know how to deal with them. Tomorrow, if I can find it, I'll show you how Bill Barker deals with this very subject as Thomas Jefferson. Lacks historicity, which is really what we're talking about in the picture. You know, are you an 1830s fort and you just wear pioneer clothes? What are pioneer clothes? A large part of the authenticity and that makes you part of that artifact environment, that authority is the correct clothes. And people think they can just open an old timey site and put on any old pioneer dress. That's actually what makes this difficult is because the research drives sort of the, the genre or the milieu that it happens in. I would rather see people do experimental archeology span well and show about how to make bread in an orno in a uniform for the museum than wear period clothing and do it badly. And that's where you get into the factually flawed part of it. Um, you know, we catch each other all the time and this is where, you know, you've got to know your name and dates. And part of what we'll talk about tomorrow is these different kinds of visitors. There's some that want to just talk to you about what they know. Just let them talk. But once you become factually flawed, it's hard to come back from that. Unless the only way to come back from that is to correct yourself. I found out, so. Does all that make sense? It does. It really and does. And so it it's almost better not to do it than to do it badly. Yes. Because what happens is, is um, you get a following and people know, you know, like there's a museum down in New Mexico that contradicts everything that we know about the person that the house is about. And I'll mm -hmm. just put that. And you don't want to, you don't want to be that site because it gets out there, but. Exactly. Site appropriateness. This is another thing. When I took on uh, Fort Vasquez, we have an 800 square foot gallery with restrooms attached, courtyard that's fenced with sort of stockade coyote fencing, and a 100 foot square mud square that's not near enough tall or represents the actual site built by the WPA. That's a challenge because most people think of, when you think of fort stuff, you think of Bensel Fort. You know, that place is dynamic. If you haven't been there, you need to go. It's, I know. it's, it's amazing. It's amazing, okay? But I don't have those things. So my programs are specifically either workshop archeology span stuff, we'll recreate something together, or third person, we're gonna do very specific demonstrations about aspects of this time period or culture, uh, meaning the fur trade culture.
um, do you even have a historical facility? It may not, if you don't, if you're, you may turn to a more theatric presence to do the interpretive program. Another thing is management support. You and your staff may want to do this really badly, but if there's no more support from it for management, if people aren't eager to come do it, then find a different way to do it. Maybe you start with the experimental archeological aspect. Maybe it's easier. Budgetary support. That's a huge problem too, because, you know, these bygone tools to really do them correctly, sometimes you have to build them yourself. Like we just built a forge cart, a traveling blacksmith forge, a little cart. We built that in my garage from scratch um, in order to have that. I mean, the Ornos were built from scratch, volunteers, you'll see. If you don't have the money or you can't raise it, that's going to limit your program. Collection support, this is especially important from a, a historic house perspective. Get them to take and give you at least a room in the house where people can experience it. That will change your site's dynamic. The more rooms that you can effectively use, and I mean use them like they're meant to be used, better off. Your volunteers and staff, are they in, are, again, we'll go back to the human aspect. Are they wanting to do this? Do they want to help do this? Don't ever make somebody do it who doesn't want to. Knowledge and research, that's a continual thing. And that sort of goes back to the management support. You have to have time to develop new programs. I heard as recently in 2016, the average life, it used to be five years for a museum program per the National Park Service is now two and a half years. So. Wow, okay. Yeah. The, the more the, the dynamic changes and trends changes we'll talk about, the more people's view of the world changes, the more we have to change to, to address that. Yeah. That goes right through opportunities through popular trends. Pay attention to what people are doing. If there's a big drive for a barbecue festival, maybe you need to research what barbecue was like in the 1860s. How do I, how do I get that festival's aspect to come to my place that weekend? Or how do I, maybe it's big enough where I just make it a regular offering. Maybe, you know, um, maybe my site's better for interpreting and doing period or heirloom agriculture. Um, how do I get that going at my site? And our people, because there's a big trend right now in uh, survival skills, homesteading and self reliance, mm -hmm. old time canning and food ways, brewing and distilling. Um, gardening, all those things are really, really, really hot right now. Yeah. And people are looking for those ways as things like 4-H are funded by schools, ways for their children and their, and their young people to do those. And then find out what the community likes. Does the community, like I said, does the community have a chili cook-off? Find an 1860s chili recipe. And even if you don't make any, and you don't win first prize at the chili cook-off, Take your old time chili to the rotary chili cook off and serve it just to get your face out there. Does that make sense? Yep, absolutely. Oh, oh. Um, so there's a book by a, a, a museum manager from Santa Cruz. It's an art museum book. And not all of it applies, but it is a very good book. And it's called The Art of Relevance by Nina Simon, not Nina Simone, Nina Simon. And um, relevance is what unlocks your museum. There's still an audience for the old style museum, which I kind of call a reliquary, which is you have a bunch of artifacts and it told the artifacts tell the story. Yeah. I would every time the artifacts don't tell the story because if I don't understand what that artifact is or I'm interested in how it works, if you as the museum docent don't know, then you've failed. And that's what relevance is really about is you know, what is it about the, your site that can communicate those universal experiences and, his, and what it's like to live in, in the history of the past today? I mean, whenever we do a food program, there's a recipe that goes out with it. Whenever we serve 
you know, places I've done that have tea or drinks, we send the recipe home with you. You can take a flyer home. We talk about how to make it. And because people want to be able to do it for themselves. And that product is a part of what we do. And there's another book called The Experience Economy, which is also in the resources. Um, and there's specific chapters in there that really talk about why theme restaurants and amusement parks are king to the you know, popular culture. Why do people go to the Hard Rock Cafe? Why do people go to um, Disneyland? It's the experience. So many times people just want to interact and have a social interaction over the history where, you know, normally it's like, here's your ticket, walk in. They want their question answered. And it's okay to say, I don't know, only if you're willing to go find out what the answer is. And so it's a basic part of the National Association of Interpreters in Fort Collins, their interpretive training is like customer service, being present, not ignoring the visitors, asking them if they have questions. It's a customer service job and that's where, it doesn't matter if you're doing living history or not, that's how you up, uphold the mission of your museum. And more often than not, you'll have them tell you a story about something historically important to them, and that makes them feel a sense of belonging, and thus you've done your job. And they'll probably come back. Um, I've had several long discussions with people about their genealogy, and they always come back, or about what their grandparents did to survive, or, they're like you're saying your husband i'm a descendant of so and so and this was you know my ancestors were here um i've had a little kid come in this is a great story walks in the gallery sees a picture of louis vasquez and starts jumping up and down i knew that's what he was looking at and i went over and i said excuse me why are you so excited he goes that would have been my seven times great grandpa oh that boy <laughs> is that's why you do the job right i mean you know yes. And so that you're actually creating your own community with it by creating, using relevance and that you can do that with your volunteers. You can do that with your schools. I have, I actually don't have one community. I have like six communities all from different schools and different echelon parts of the, the greater area around me. And that's what you're trying to call today. Right. So we'll probably, probably um, do a couple more slides. And this is my example slide. So the people in the, standing around the brick oven, those were my first year volunteers. They built our first half size Orno, which you can see there I'm using interpretive opportunity. Maintenance is always an interpretive opportunity if you can do it in your building with period tools. And it gave the first program we really did there that was big was bread. It sounds really silly, but people, the smell, the taste, the texture, um, even the sound of the fire crackling creates interaction for people about their past. And not just with people who are, you know, Remember the grandma, but we had people from all walks of life, all ethnicities. We had people correcting us on how we use the Orno. We had people, you know, people from New Mexico were like, oh, no, 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 you don't do it like that. It was actually very helpful. I welcomed them to, t to correct us because we want to use it authentically. And, I, you know, that's what a simple feature like this can do. And that's what I'm talking about with relevance is, don't just churn butter because you think they churn butter. We're, we're really sure they had one in the, at some point at, at one part of the fort because of what's there. We know they had a kitchen and this, would, this is standard kitchen equipment. So do something, promote it as being your own and it does all these things with one shot, if you will. It kills many birds with one stone. But if you pay attention to popular media, the local foodways, what, and, and it's okay to copy me. Look at what other museums are doing. I mean, if I knew that, if I knew they had a distillery there, I'd be making booze. I'm not lying. I, mean, I think it's a great, it's a great hook. People are fascinated with the chemistry part of that. 
Other, uh, do your historical research. You have the golden, you know, trunks of diaries. Search. Exactly. That's a great way to do it. And then, especially if, you're, if your community is known for barbecue, I'm just pulling something out of my ear again, and you find a barbecue sauce recipe, do that. Go to the Rotary meeting in costume and go to their barbecue cook-off and pass out tastes of your barbecue. Make sure you do it legally. And there's ways to do that. And that's what the community partnership part is. Find those people who are excited. Find businesses. I mean, there's businesses I work with and have worked with in the past that have supplied me with, for example, the Locust Grove Distillery pieces. Those people donated, like the copper still was donated from a still maker. The apples are donated from an apple farm. Get them to help you to build your program and then advertise their product for them. So if you're demonstrating making cider with a cider press and get the apples from up the hill from Bob's Apple Farm, you know, not only thank them, but tell people how to get the apples. That creates a huge, the community is not just your visitors, it's those that support you. Right. Finally, you have uh, issues of social justice. Um, social justice is huge right now. And what is social justice is things like slavery and ethnicity and gender and, and women's suffrage. These are things that my institution's tackling head on. It's a little different in the fur trade. Um, you know, ours things are native rights and that's a, that's a huge consultation process we do with tribes before it ever gets out the front door to the visitor seeing it. But it's something we're grappling with. These may be things you either shy away from or find experts to help you with. I mean, you know, maybe you'll find some, you know, descendant that was a, you know, suffragette or something for uh, women's vote. I don't know, but those are very popular programs because I think it does two things. It gives people a voice who don't have a voice. And it also upholds the fact that it's part of the American experience to dissent, to have conversation. You know, that's what the great experiment's about, right? People fought over this stuff since we've been invented. So, and then finally, what are the visitors and probably at the foundation of it all, start taking, even if it's a simple half page, this is what did you think of our event today? Write your favorite part down. Start gleaning those visitor perceptions and do active listening. Why did you come today? Oh, because we had animals? And if you start hearing that over and over and over, that means you should be concentrating, creating that relevant animal program. Maybe it's, maybe you can only have chickens, you know? Um, maybe you can have a cow, I don't know. But, but listen to what people want from your site. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you can tie it into history. Um, case in point, Nash Farm um, in Texas, they're a 1900 farm, but apparently, at one point, the people used their barn in the 1940s and 50s for saw cops. So what did they do? They had a picnic saw cop event. That's totally not what I would think my friends there would do, but it's one of their most, they have a big band, they have a, a, a rockabilly band, they have old car clubs show up. It's one of their signature events. That's, that's important. That's what makes the rest of the year. So, any questions about any of this? Is this all making sense? It is. It is. So, a lot of similar things that either we have, we've tried. I'm glad to, you know, get some things that I have not tried yet. So, yeah, you know, and one of the things I could tell you being in this is, you know, you get, you come up with a great idea, what you think is a great idea. And if it isn't, you got to abandon it. It's yeah. terrible sometimes. Yeah. But, you have to be to willing to try else. new things and let some of the other ones go as you right. I mean, with the people and what they want. And be like with our forge cart project, we know that they had a blacksmith shop there. I can't build on the site because of its historic nature, but I build. I built a traveling portable forge that can go around the from the period from period schematics as closely as possible, and that replica can now teach blacksmithing because blacksmithing was huge back then, especially the fur trade, so. So, outcomes of living history. Um, you want your volunteers to be rewarded with their passion. So 
So that Adobe Brick story I told you earlier, that really happened to me. And I swore I would, and I didn't go, I went back a couple more times and I left that site and went on other places. Well, the point of the story is, is I, I tell all my volunteers, I'll never make you make Adobe Bricks, large quotes, because I don't want to saddle you with your weakness. As long as it fits into the, mil, the, the, the story of the fort, or you can find something that does that you want to champion, always them, try to give them their, their, their voice. And um, try to tie everything back to national history. The part of the things that living history sites oftentimes lose focus on is, okay, so I'm a site about stagecoaches in your case. It's 18th prior to the railroad. Most people don't have an idea about how long that took or the distance or what the railroad did to the stagecoaches. Tie it back to national importance and then go out, almost like rings on the water, go out from there in concept. So you, even though you're a local museum, try and tie it to the relevant history of the region. Um, Again, try, you don't always have to use living history as your main, it could be a main thing, but a good site will balance, like Connor Prairie has a water park that's historical, believe it or not. Wow. I, yeah, I don't know how they did that one. They also have a concert venue and a farm. Um, go look at connorprairie.org, it's amazing. Um, they only use 270 acres of their 950, and it's amazing. Wow. They, they punch many buttons with that one living history part. Now that may be difficult for people like you and I to do, they're you know, sort of one man shows, but you can scale that down to be, you know, don't always, the problem with living history is, is if you've seen it once, sometimes you've seen it all. You never want to fall on that trap. Right. And that's what's listening to your visitors. I have no problem with people showing up and having a car show at my site. Because that'll bring in somebody who never would have been there. And then I've got them. I have no right. having a taco truck at my site, which I do every day because it brings new people in and wouldn't stop. I have no problem with having the local farmer's market once in a while in my North parking lot because it brings people in. And so those other sort of non-characteristic historical things create new audience. Okay. Right. You want to always try and facilitate that deeper understanding and that site-specific expanded particip participation. And when you know you have done well when you start seeing people return and even people asking to volunteer. So those were huge, huge hallmarks of success. And then in my case, I had a site where some of the community had spread a rumor that it was going to be sold. Um, I've since erased that for the majority simply by keeping it upkept, keeping activity, and keeping viable in the community. And then you may have to go join something like Rotary or, like I said, go to the Harvest Fair and put on your weird clothes and hand out flyers. And I call it weird clothes because that's how you're, you know. <laughs> Look, those are some of the, the potential outcomes from what you're doing. It's not always going to be purely historical. You need to interface yeah. yourself. Like a great example of this is a friend of mine who works at Plymouth Plantation, which is the Pilgrim Living History Site in Massachusetts. And he's a Wampanoag native interpreter there. He's actually Wampanoag Indian. He and a, another a, a Pilgrim guy, they had this about five years ago, win a Thanksgiving dinner with John, with uh, Miles Standish and whatever his native name was. And they'd come to your house, Thanksgiving Day to eat dinner with your family in character, but yet they were delivered by a limousine. It was a it was very popular. Um, oh. They they raised a lot of funds with that raffle. So definitely uh, think outside the box. Social consciousness. This is one of the last ones, and this is something I harp on. And if I get too preachy, you can tell me to shut up, Bill. But especially in the West or when we deal with frontier history, there's a lot of tendency to want to show very, very earnestly Native American issues. And this also goes for colonial sites with slavery or, you know, Hispanic sites with Hispanic, Hispanic, anybody who's different, basically 
there's some rules. First of all, if you're gonna do that, you have to let those constituents of that group of people have free voice to tell history, you know, not totally free, but with respect in their point of view, if you want it to be authentic, okay? That also goes for what they wear. They can't wear, like that's, this is literally a picture of a Halloween costume, the woman who's crossed out. Yeah. Um, seen this dozens of times, don't ever do that. Just avoid the native issue. Um, and what's the big trend now is since we're on land that belong to tribal people is before your programs, if you're a tribal site, acknowledge that. That's the right thing to do. This was the homeland of the Cheyenne Arapaho people, whatever. Um, and like I said, it's really, this is something that's really very hard. Allow those people to have their own voice and tell their traditional stories um, and honor those resources and, and sites or, or features at your site with uniqueness. They are special. They're disappearing like crazy, but you'd be surprised how many people don't. Um, yeah. It's not their thing. It's really, this is how we get through some of the problems we're having in society right now. And museums are leading the way. So I would suggest you only invite tribal and native people or people from that, you know, never dress up as an Indian if you're not an Indian person. Oh, right. Yeah. And I mean, I, I cannot believe I still find this. Big places back east still do this because they, they say they can't hire native interpreters. Uh, Colonial Williamsburg, Plymouth Plantation, Conner Prairie, they've all done a good job at this. Of course, these are mega sites, but if you invite someone to speak on native issues, make sure they're really a native elder or at least a native native constituent. You know, make sure if you do native art at your site, somebody's doing beadwork, you know, either say they're not native and they're emulating it or say give their full as much of a rich biography as possible you know um and then you know i mean that's the that's sort of the we have a guy that's a sort of talented bead worker but he's not native but he's like this is how i learned to do bead work this is very similar these are the similar techniques and we disclose all that up front we're not we're not teaching you know and then if the person is you know of a specific tribe or group represent that with authenticity and respect. And that seems to be a problem still um, in wearing museums. That's why I have the woman here. This is actually a, a woman, a female colleague of mine, Jessica. She's, she does a Woodland Indian School. That's her own business. And she caters to museums. And she's actually Winnebago and another tribal affiliate. And she does traditional Woodland Indian lifeways and dress. and Again, it's third person. So she's telling, teaching kids how to grind corn and make maple syrup from scratch, but in the specific names and all that. So it's very important to honor that. And when you have a frontier site, this is always a tripping hazard. Now, how do I talk about Indians if we don't have any Indians? I don't assume, even though I read deeply and I could probably have another degree in Native American studies, I don't ever try to talk about like I've done it or seen it. I recommend books and let the books speak for themselves. Or try just to say, you know, this isn't my culture, but this is what I understand. I never talk about spirituality um, because people, have, you know, well, they put on that shield, there's a buffalo painted on. What does that mean? I never answer that question. And, I, and that's one of those times where it's like, I don't know. It's very... I, I, the, the answer that's appropriate is that is me a special meaning to the person who painted it. That's the right answer. Right. Never try and interpret, you know, spirituality or specific. It's just not respectful, and unless you have that voice. So, any questions? Correct. No, I don't think so. Okay. So resources. Um, I can give you all of these. Um, and we'll open up tomorrow. I can, I can, if you give me your email, I'll send them to you. But meaningful interpretation will be covered tomorrow. That is by the godfather of interpretation, Freeman Tilden. If you haven't heard his name yet, you will. I have. <laughs> you have? Oh, yeah. 
Okay. Yeah, that's that. You know, he that's speaks in a lot of the Bible. Yeah. It's the Bible, you know. Yes. But you'd still be surprised how many people have never read it. Um, sure. Interpreting for park visitors, I mentioned. Yep. Um, Khrushchev's Shoe is an interesting book. That's by a man named Roy Underhill, who you may know from PBS Saturday Mornings because he had a show called The Woodwright Shop, where he would make old-time woodworking. Yes. If people don't know this. Roy Underhill is quite was quite involved with Colonial Williamsburg, and was a, was a big administrator there, and was very much into the way of how he taught people. Uh, and part of his ideas still are embedded there. He's a great guy to talk to if you ever run into him. Experience Economy by Joseph by B. Joseph Pine. That's a very specific book. Um, there are two specific chapters in that book. Basically, what you are selling the public is an experience. That's your product. How you how you proceed. And that's really just as much as anything else is creating relevance. Uh, opening Doors to Great Guest Experiences by Connor Prairie. This one you would have to call them and ask for. This is a DVD and booklet presentation that you can train interpreters with. I thought about showing it, but didn't know what. And I feel like it's weird to, it's not ethical for me to do that. But I do recommend it because it's the, it's the culmination done in 20, 2005 of their three-year study where they mic'd people. And we'll talk about a lot of that tomorrow, the kinds of visitors. Okay. Uh, another Connor Prairian is someone who's at the Longmont Museum now, and that's Mr. David B. Allison. He wrote a book called Just Living History, and it's got a subtitle, but I'm giving you the short form version here. Mm -hmm. Okay. Museum. If you want some really good consultation, David B. Allison is the man. He worked on that project. And he, just by chance, he married a Coloradan and his wife. I don't know what she does, but he was at Denver Museum of Nature and Science until recently for quite a few years. And now he's there. He's sort of one of the architects of that project. You might want to just call him and tell him I sent you. And he might be able to help you with some suggestions or charge you money. I don't know. He's yeah, very, very He's very willing to talk about it. Past into Present by Stacey F. Roth. That's a great book. That goes into detail about the cognitive levels of learning, uh, especially with kids. Um, that's a great book. And How to Write a First Person Presentation. It's a little clunky on that, but you know, there's no roadmap. And then the next two books are fairly recent and fairly controversial. The Art of Relevance written for mostly art museums, but it really does talk about how to build a community, how to leverage community interest, and it's pretty good. Um, not all of it jives completely with living history because the person is an art museum person, but how do you get people interested in your museum again? How do you create that relevance? And then sort of along the same lines is uh, Frank Vignone's Anarchist Guide to Historic House Museums. Um, we'll be talking about that tomorrow too. Frank is called a maverick for a reason. He has some pretty radical ideas about how to do that. But he's been very successful. And he's currently at Old Salem Museum in South Carolina. He's currently director there. I like it when things get shut, when we, when we break the mold a little bit. Um, it's very easy in this avocation to become sort of insulated from our own our own society and no this is the way it's always done and so he's a great one for that um again i don't agree with everything these people say but these are all really good source material books uh for websites of course connor prairie colonial Williamsburg, plymouth plantation there's one in Colorado that I keep my eye on because they do have a pretty good program. And if you haven't been there, it's worth a visit. It's in Colorado Springs and that's Rockledge Ranch. If you haven't been there, it's worth a visit. They're not, they're doing their own thing. Um, it's a nice site. Have you ever been there? I have not. I, it has come up on my radar. I have it like down I, I, that I should go see them. Go before September because they're seasonal. They're highly seasonal. Right. Um, Ben's Fort, which is on there, that's the NPS site. Okay. Um, Nash Farm in Grapevine, Texas. Those are friends that's of mine. That's the one. 
fantastic job with taking what was really kind of a clunky agriculture museum and just like a historic house green space and really turned it on its ear from the saw cop thing, the whiskey tasting thing. They've now revitalized the railroad that used to serve that part of Dallas as part of the cotton growing industry. They've got that going now. I mean, they're really gaining uh, steam. And then Golandrinas, Las Golandrinas in Santa Fe, does some interesting ethnic, uh, Hispanic, Hispanic history. Very, very rich in that heritage. It's the premier living history museum, really kind of in the Southwest, I would say, for now. Is, is that the one um, by Santa Fe? Yeah. A lot of the revenue, though, comes from being a movie, movie location. But there's nothing wrong with that. But they have an active Catholic church on their side. Right. Um, they do a lot of very interesting Hispanic arts and crafts, like the, the Santos, they paint those, do the tin art, lots of food ways. They grow a lot of things, they have a lot of animals. Yeah. Old Salem, that's where Frank is at. And then Locust Grove, you can see how contemporary that looks. Go look at the distillery project, it lists all who was involved. Um, and so, yeah, those are, the, those are the, the resources. And if you have any questions, about any of those you can't find, just let me know and I'll get you the Amazon link or whatever. Um, I can't, I'll look for them. That would, this is great. I love uh, getting well, new resources. That's, that's great. And I'll, I'll actually put you in touch tomorrow. We'll talk about different living history groups and people and national organizations. Alfam by is no means the big one. I will say Alfam though is probably the one that speaks to the interpreter the most. Um, in Colorado, there's the Mountain Plains Museum Association, which I'm involved with, with Henry, the guy you saw, you know, the other definition. Um, there's QAM, Colorado, Wyoming Area Museum or, or Association. Yeah, I've heard of that one. Uh -huh. um, and there's a lot. I mean, there's a lot of stuff just close by. Another one I did on here is in Wichita, Kansas, and that's Old Cowtown Museum. They took a village model of historic Wild West buildings and turned it into a living history site. It's pretty interesting because they have like wider first jail, even though they weren't there, they put them all together to make a town. Yeah. They've had interesting uh, ideas there too. Another one is uh, the Stir Prairie Museum up in uh, Grand Island, Nebraska, which friends of mine work at. That's okay. pretty interesting. I've gone there a couple times. But so for tomorrow, we'll revisit all of these concepts. We'll look at some, probably some socially conscious things. Um, There'll be less sort of slides, more videos. And I want you, if you have specific questions, since it's just you and me, come back yeah, to those. Um, and we'll definitely talk about, you know, anything specific. But there's a lot to talk about in training volunteers. I'll tell you some horror stories. <laughs> there, are few, there are a few, but they're major. And, you know, sort of, and I think I put this in the last slide here. Oh, these are the links to the videos that I'm going to show. But I'll get you those. So tomorrow we'll talk about we'll talk about um, tennis of interpretation. Uh, our view as being authorities, um, you know how that works for and against us. Best practice and challenges, volunteers and staff, um, motivational, basic psychology stuff. And if you have a program trend or you want to talk about or an idea for your site. I, again, I am your captive, you know, expert. You tell me what you want to know, ask me questions or give me an example. Even if you hold up a picture or whatever, I'd gladly help. That's why I'm here. 